Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, and thank you so much for coming today to our presentation entitled Bicoastal NGS for Next Generation Support. My name is Jerry Flynn. I'm from Pepperdine University in the Los Angeles area, and I'm today with my good friend Tom Hoover, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor and CIO of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And in today's presentation, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview, overview about uh, what next generation support is. Tom is then going to tell you about his experience trying to implement it at, uh, at Chattanooga. I'll tell you a little bit about our experience with it at Pepperdine. And Tom will conclude by giving you some strategies that you might follow if you're interested in adopting next generation support and, and telling you about some uh, hurdles that you might face or some uh, challenges you might face. So <clears throat> what is the first thing that comes to mind when I say support? How do people get support typically at, at your institution? My guess is via the help desk. There may be other ways to get it, but I know at Pepperdine, typically if someone wants help, they'll call, they'll call up the help desk. And um, okay, if that's true, then what is the first thing that comes to mind when I say help desk? And um, uh, work with me, I want a little uh, a word association. I say help desk and you say, what? Telephone. telephone. Excellent. Telephone. Work with me here. Email. Email. Walk, in. Walk in. So the ways are, those are ways to get it. How about the good, the bad, and the ugly? Does anything else come to mind when I say help desk? Candidly, honestly. Frontline. What's that? Frontline support. Frontline support. Trouble everybody run. Trouble everybody run. Okay, now we're getting there. Uh, I'll be very candid. Um, people have refer to the no help desk or even the, um, here's my favorite, the help less desk. Now that's a direct insult and I take umbrage at that, but we gotta be very honest and that's what we're gonna be here today is telling, talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so why is this? What are some common help desk problems? Well, Tom and I were talking about this and concurring that um, there are, there are a number of them, but often the feedback that we've gotten is, you know what, Jerry, it it's, takes too long for you to answer the call. People hang up before they even come get through. Uh, the time on the phone, it takes a long time for me to kind of explain what the issue is, and people ask these kind of unrelated questions, um, like, did you clear your cash? Well, yeah, I, I work in IT. I, I did that. Um, um, and also, inconsistency. From my own experience, I had one of the greatest help desk experience of my life from my own help desk. Um, I had a trouble configuring VPN and, uh, and I knew the system well, it was strange, but I, I called in to see what I could do and the guy tunneled in using a remote support tool, looked at it, tweaked a few configurations, got me up and running. It was the best support I've had with any help desk anywhere. At the same time, I've called um, on a relatively simple issue and they're saying, you know, what campus are you at? And I'm, well, Pepperdine, I mean, this is <laughs> my help desk, you know. Uh, well, the Malibu campus, you know, um, it's irrelevant because it's a non-location-based you know, question. Anyway, there was inconsistency. And, um, and um, you know, I, I met a, a lady at um, a pizzeria in the North End. It's called Regina Pizzeria. I highly recommend it. Wonderful. And she's not in higher ed at all. And she was talking about calling her help desk, and she had an Excel question. And uh, the person said, you should take a class in Excel. Click, hang up. And so I just want, I'm not trying to impugn my help desk or yours, but there are some common problems. And I think if you're honest with yourself, if you've ever called a help desk for anything, anywhere, there are good, the bad, and the ugly. So we're here today to tell you about next generation support, which is not just the help desk, by the way. It's not just the help desk, although it often starts there. Um, and what it requires is rethinking support and how we offer support from regular people's shoes. And I use the word peoples intentionally as opposed to users, which we often do, because users to me connotes heroin addict. And um, I think that's really important is that these aren't users who are calling, they're people. I was a person I was calling in. Uh, the lady was a person who was calling in, your person who's calling in. And so we, what we need to do for those of us who offer support, need to put ourselves in people's shoes, the student, the faculty member, the staff member. Um, and so having done that then, how can we use our 
knowledge and genius in the IT world to create solutions for these people, a solution center, if you will. So <clears throat> what are the attributes? So these are common problems that, that we have shared at our institutions. What are common, or rather, what are the attributes of next generation support if they indeed map to the things I just mentioned? Among them are these. More self-service. In general life, if you need something, don't you often Google it? You can figure that out, right? But we've gotten some feedback that it's hard to kind of Google, find out uh, how to use various services or tools at our institutions. Another attribute of next generation support is quicker response times. And then finally, better customer satisfaction. And if you are applying these principles, putting yourself in people's shoes and um, either trying to ha have them help themselves or respond to a true problem quickly, I think you'll find that your customer satisfaction goes up. So next generation uh, involves this, but what about this? Now at first glance when I read this, uh, it was you know, kind of sarcastic, it's a bad thing. And the truth is at, at my institution, Pepperdine, um, yeah, this, this is a bad thing. Uh, you know, we get some very good survey satisfaction numbers from people who call in. I'm going to share that with you later. But many people avoid calling because they have been burned. Um, and so you can look at this cartoon in, in a negative light, right? People just are not going to call anymore. However, next generation support has, in many ways, this same goal, but for different reasons. Now, there's not a negative connotation, but rather if we make self-help easier, they won't need to call as frequently. Uh, if we analyze the calls that do come in and see patterns and fix things to preempt future calls from coming in, then they won't need to call in as frequently. And if we have a training outreach where we see patterns of things that different groups of people struggle with, and we proactively go out and train people so that they aren't lost, they, they know how to use Excel, as that, that lady I mentioned, then they won't be, be calling in as much. And so it, we can achieve the goal of this character, not in a negative way, but actually in a positive way. So what I mentioned thus far are conceptuals about next generation support. But what do they look like at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga? And what do they look like at Pepperdine? Well, in many ways, our institutions are a tale of two cities. And um, by the way, you recall the opening title was Bi-Coastal Next Generation Support. We, we are aware that Chattanooga is not actually on the coast, but it's on the coast of the Tennessee River, so you give us that. But it's, about, it's almost 3,000 miles away. Anyway, um, Tom's school is public, mine is private. He has significantly more students than do, does Pepperdine. Uh, Chattanooga charges a student fee and is able to fund some things with it. Pepperdine doesn't. Um, importantly, our help desks, uh, Chattanooga is open Monday through Friday, 8 to 6, I believe, and Pepperdine is open 24-7. So in many ways, uh, it's a tale of two cities. It doesn't sound similar. But as we got to talking, kind of scrutinizing both the challenges and the opportunities there, we realized that we're very similar. We have similar problems, and we're coming up with similar solutions. So I'm very grateful for everyone attending today. Um, Tom is now going to detail his experience with Next Generation Support at UT Chattanooga. Thanks, Jerry. I just want to point out our tuitions are not the same either, so. Um. Touche, <laughs> touche. <laughs> um, a lot less expensive. Um, but yes, thanks, Jerry. Uh, so basically, yes, uh, I blew up the help desk. Uh, I did this about a, about a month and a half ago. Um, I try my best not to use the word help desk anymore, um, focusing on the word call center now, uh, just because of the connotation we've had with the, the help desk in the past. Um, we have a not so great history with uh, the help desk at UTC. It's been poorly funded. Um, it's a hundred, it has been 100% student workers um, since, since day one. They never had full-time employees on the, on the phone there, primarily because um, people didn't want to do the phones and they didn't feel that it was of, of value to the university. Uh, so we had incom inconsistent support, uh, poor documentation or lack of documentation at all. Um, we had a, I did a change in leadership about a year ago where I tried to move somebody in there. Uh, it, it was unsuccessful. It didn't work. 
Um, I knew that, and I was getting a lot of pressure from the rest of the university that I had to do something. Um, I had to do something pretty radical or risk the, lo risk the potential of actually losing that department or that function in, in IT. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was that bad. Um, it was, you know, we talked about the unhelp desk, uh, non-help desk where you have people bypassing, and you know, just all the things that, that Jerry had talked about before. I, I, that it was, uh, it was, it was not a good situation. That, that's for sure. And how many people actually have student workers on your help desk here? I'm just curious. Okay, how many are were in, are entirely student help desk or student run? Okay, and you know, it was one of those things. You know, nothing necessarily wrong. It just wasn't with the fluctuation of students. You get them for, you know, for a year, maybe two years. Uh, with their schedules, it was it was just it didn't it didn't work very well, um, and so then you know obviously I had to make some changes. Uh, the purpose of creating a call center uh, here was really to kind of change. First of all, I'm all about you know sometimes you have to change names with organizations um, in order to be able to get to change the stigma of the old organization in order for them to see it new. Uh, yes, you know it's a gimmick, but you know it, it often works, um, and it's a way to kind of rebrand yourself. Uh, the purpose of creating a call center here was to really create um, a central point for IT where they are going to take all calls, uh, and that's why I came up with a little graphic here. There's other departments for my staff that's here. There are other departments. I didn't leave you out or, you know, I'm not getting rid of departments. I, I just I haven't put everybody in there. But really, my whole point was to kind of make the call center the central point for IT, the focus of IT. Um, it's often, as you all know, it really is the face of IT in a lot of ways. And we have our guys that are um, in, we have our data centers in Hunter and call it kind of like the dungeon and a couple of people work in here, but you all are, are face, or you actually work with end users or people, not heroin users, but um, so, but you know, a lot of people typically in IT, you know, the typical shorts or, you know, flip flops and, um, you know, really was really the focus is to really make the focus of IT organization is that and then those other kind of branch off of there. Um, and that's why I was trying to play the, the vital role there of really understanding how the call center really becomes you know, your IT in a way. Um, as far as you know, historically, as I said before, minimal resources. We had a director. Um, the director was in charge of client services. And outside of, the, outside of her, her office was the help desk with the student workers there. So she was managing another department. And then while she was listening, she'd be trying to help, you know, the student workers actually, you know, help on the help desk. And it just didn't work. There wasn't a person that's dedicated full time to it. It wasn't a priority, which in some respects is weird because, you know, if you look at the, the, where your exposure and where most people contact in IT, it's your help desk. So it's kind of, your, your priorities are kind of, kind of backwards. Um, so what I've done is I'm reassigning four, so I'll have four full-time people on the help desk. My goal is to have a full-time FTE there whenever the help desk is open. Um, and yes, we're not going to be able to, we, we're going to have to still have student workers on there. Please, if you, there's some, plenty of seats if you want to sit down, please. Um, and I'm, no pressure or anything. Um, but if there, you know, my whole goal is to have someone there so that someone can be there supporting, listening, and helping. Um, yes, you know, can we have, are we going to be able to have only full-time staff? No. Um, but I'm trying to have as many as possible and at least be able to step it up there and actually have, you know, some ownership there. Um, and it, so basically we're talking about full-time, full, four, four full-time workers and then uh, 20, 25 student workers. And my staff that's helping me work on this actually says it's probably closer to, you know, 40 or so to be able to handle um, the demand. Because the whole point is, if we're trying to solve, and I'll get to this in a second as far as, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but, you know, expectations here, 85% plus first time resolution uh, solved. Ambitious, but my whole thing is, you know, if we set the bar at 40 or 50%, right now it's about 60%. If you set the bar low, low you will achieve low. So, you know, 85% um, plus solved on the first call. Well, that means if you're solving the first, the, the, the call, the first call, that means you're going to be on the phone longer with them, which means you're actually going to need more people on the phone because you're not going to, because you're going to have more people helping. Does that make sense? So in effect, that actually means that we're going to have to have, put more resources, that means more people on the phones uh, in, in order to resolve that. The other thing is, you know, the top 10 things, we can all right now pr probably guess the top 10 things that your help, that people are calling your help desk for. 
my whole thing is to go ahead and solve those top 10 things proactively. Um, whether it's when they're on, the, on hold, hopefully it won't be on hold very long, but when they're on hold, you know, did you know that you can go to the IT website and you can click on the top 10? Perhaps you may be even sending out the top 10 to everyone so that they can go ahead um, regularly and say, these are the top 10 issues. If you're having this or having this, this in the future, how can you actually proactively solve your problem so you don't necessarily have to come to the help desk? Um, one of the other things we're trying to do is actually look at starting over um, from scratch on our workflow. We had a couple, it was about a, about a month ago, we had a new, uh, a new printer was bought, a new network printer was bought. And they went ahead and they called the help desk and said, you know, I have a new network printer. I don't necessarily wor know if the words network were put in there. Basically, it sat in the queue for a couple days. Our network engineering people didn't know they had to create a print queue. So and one of our guys in field support started going through and then found out oh, there's this thing. That, and actually, I got an email finding, you know, what's going on here. And I had someone look into it and they found that it was literally, it hadn't been placed in the queue for network engineering because they didn't know a new print queue had to be created. So it ended up being you know, kind of a mini d disaster. My whole thing is, uh, you know, actually working on the workflow. I mean, and that's, that's something that it takes a lot of time. Um, now, do you all use workflow at your universities? Are, how many are using uh, footprints or some type of, we're upgrading the, the next version, version 12 of, of uh, footprints. We're actually, uh, we're actually not, we're not migrating at all. We're starting from scratch on version 12. And the whole focus is for us to actually start to scratch on the workflows to actually be able to say, you know, what is the actual, how does this go? Um, and make sure we do that across the board uh, to make sure, and well dealt, uh, must be de uh, detailed and well documented and thought out. I mean, we're literally getting groups together to sit there and go, okay, what, okay, this problem comes in, what person has to be involved, what group has to be involved, so that we can try and think through it all from scratch. Because in the, in the past, it's been emails, you know, we do, we have used footprints, um, and most, of, most if not all the department does use it, but we haven't thought about it from, you know, if it goes from this, we haven't designed the whole workflow in it, um, which I'm very excited about that. Um, the other part of that is, how many use tech while in here? Okay, if, um, well, three people should be raising their hands. Um, if you haven't, look at tech wall. Um, this is not a pitch, um, it is our former boss, uh, Dr. Chester, who is at the, uh, University of Virginia, excuse me, University of Georgia, um, and it's, uh, he's in charge of TechWall. It's a technology um, survey that we send out to our, our students, staff, and faculty annually. We get some pretty good results. Uh, we can specify questions. You can ask about wireless. The particular question that was asked here was, how would you like to receive support? Perfect for this. You know, the whole thing is if you can meet and actually give people the way they want to get support. So these are the answers. This is a wordle with the answers that, that came back. You get a call, email, chat. Um, what we're, so what we're looking to do to, based on those answers, uh, we're looking to uh, ways to support our telephone, um, obviously, uh, remote support. We use uh, Bombgar as does Pepperdine. Does anyone else use Bombgar? Great, <coughs> great tool. Um, the other thing I'm, we're looking at doing is actually using Google Hangouts. So how some of our student workers actually hang out in a Google Hangout so students can pop in there and ask questions. Um, <coughs> we're a Gmail campus, so all of our students have Google. But I mean, what we're trying to basically, my whole approach was that was, you know, meet students where they are. Um, you know, kind of be on the same wavelength with, with them. Uh, chat via the website. Bombgar has a great chat feature that can be integrated into your IT website that you can go ahead and chat. Uh, very similar to a lot of libraries do uh, remote chat support that way. So, and then walk up support. You know, just like, and I'm sure you all know when you try and, play, try and train faculty, <clears throat> not all faculty, as with us, not all of us like to be trained the same way. We're trying to give them a whole bunch of different options here, a potpourri, if you will, uh, of options for them to be able to get support. Um, the other thing we're facing is uh, bring your own device. Um, how many, uh, how many, let's see, how many on your network at your campus, how many have, at least have two devices? How many have more than two devices? All right. And so we have a typical classroom of 30 in the old days, three or four years ago, you know, real old time ago, old, old timers. Um, you now have close to 90 devices for those 30 students in your classes. I think our average is like 3.2. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so you have an explosion in your network. Here is just kind of some statistics from uh, just from, as you can see, our registered mobile devices. And I guarantee 
Uh, when we come back in the spring, it'll probably be close to 16,000 devices in there. Um, so what we're trying to do is look, you know, basically, we have our students there, you know, asking students, how do you want support? Um, you know, how can we support you uh, with your mobile device? The other part of that is to work with, um, you know, some of our work with HR into actually being proactive so that when, you know, for instance, in the onboarding process, when someone on the first day at the university, you know, you go through all these orientations about your benefits and your vacation and your sick leave and all that. How about an orientation with some things from IT? Uh, how about some training? You know, these are the common most things that you, you, you need to get started. Often, and this is not horrible, but often a lot of people on their first day, they sit on their desk because they can't do anything. Uh, because their account isn't created, because they don't know how to use Outlook, or they don't know how to use the customized things for the university. Um, but actually being involved, so what we're doing is actually working with IT to develop a program so that when someone comes there, they're actually getting trained and we can actually work with them and actually, you know, to actually use the tools for UTC. Um, and then the other, another part of that is you know, I have work with HR to require class attendance. Uh, actually having staff and faculty attend an IT class at least once a year. Um, now, I would love not only going over some, like, whether it's office or some of the tools for the university, but security. Um, how about actually telling them and showing them how to use their secure browsing or how, what they should be doing with their, their, with their university, not, you know, not their personal, their university-owned machine, um, and, and how to use that. Because you know, they, if they need, in respect, not to get on a soapbox, but they have to, as far as the security stuff, they've got to take some ownership there. Uh, and this would be one way of actually doing that. The other is process improvement. Anyone heard of Ball Bridge before? It's a process improvement. In Tennessee, it's called the Tennessee Excellence. Um, it's, a, it's a process improvement, which basically a lot of hospitals do it. Uh, there's awards out there. Uh, we'll be filing for a process improvement or a, a Baldridge uh, application this year, which is, um, it's, it basically looks at some processes. If you can show improvement or streamlining, uh, you, can, you can get a, a, awards. But hospitals use that to, I mean, it's a good, it's very good for hospitals and for businesses. And we're trying to kind of bring that same intellect, that same uh, knowledge at, at the UTC as far as efficiencies. Uh, we're looking for ways to, to streamline. Uh, one thing, we're, we're, we have some accounts that we work with the University of Knoxville, uh, University of Tennessee up there, so we share some things. So currently right now, when, um, when people want to have a, a Zoom account, you know, I get an email. Well, we're looking so where our help desk will automatically, once the email comes into the help desk, or uh, not necessarily, but if they call in or fill out a, uh, an online form, it'll actually automatically be sent out to Knoxville so the account will be created so that you know, I'm not involved, um, and it all, actually no one will be involved. It'll be automatically created. So just looking for ways to, to streamline, looking for ways to become more efficient. It's one of these things. You kind of have to step back. I mean, it sounds, none, of this is, I mean, none of the things we're talking about today are novel, but it's all taking some time to actually be deliberate and, and, and accomplishing it. Uh, today's students, yes, they were born. In fact, I have, uh, I have a, four, my, my, my daughter and my son, um, they can use an iPad. One's uh, four years, one's six. I mean, they're all over, just as all the children we know. That's one thing, but it's actually being able to use that device for an educational, uh, for educational means is an entirely different thing. So one of the other parts of this is to actually work with these students of this generation um, and these devices, but actually, you know, not just to be an angry birds thing, but for them to actually be able to use uh, the device for educational purposes and to enhance their learning experience, which is really what they're going to college for. Um, again, um, on again on the uh, the staff faculty side working with those devices because they all have devices we all have devices that aren't universally on the machine but we're using it for university things so how can we and as my boss says and I, I just say this for him you know, he just always he calls these devices you know angry bird devices um, so every time there's an every time someone owns an iPad he just refers to it as another so my whole point was he's like I want you to make sure that they actually are doing more than just angry birds on it so I'm, I'm doing my best to do that with applications and um, and for, for work. Um, maturity of organization, I believe that the natural evolution of, I, of an IT organization, really a maturity, is this next generation call center. Um, it's, uh, real, I mean, I just see it as really the next, you know, as you've got, I don't know, it, it just, to me, that's, that's kind of how it, it, it sees, that when you have a call center that's you know, deeply developed, um, integrated into the culture, uh, and accomplishing all these things, it changes your entire, entire IT organization. Again, your help desk, 
your help desk, your, uni your IT department is seen through the help desk, um, and your entire, I mean, that's just a big, a, a big thing. So uh, let me go ahead and turn it over to Jerry, and he'll talk about an outsourced help desk. Thank you, Tom. So as I indicated earlier, at Pepperdine, we have outsourced our help desk. And um, we work with a, a good vendor. We have a good relationship. Um, and I'd like to walk you through a, a few of our, our stats. So if you see at the very top, this is for the month that just finished, June of 2014. And I want to, without making comment, just draw your attention to a few things. On the left-hand side, four rows down, it says average speed to answer. In June of this year, it was 49 seconds. That is, it took them 49 seconds to answer the phone. And year to date is 51 seconds, so about 50 seconds at Pepperdine to get your call answered. If you look at the last line on that same table, average handle time in June, um, you were on the phone then talking with an operator for not quite eight minutes. Overall, it's about eight and a half for the year. Now on the second table on the right-hand side, if you look um, four rows down at closure rate, in, in June, uh, this is first call resolution. They, uh, they got you off the phone with success 60% of the time. For the year, it's closer to 70%. And the very last line, the uh, QA rating, is, uh, is the quality, as reported on, on surveys for those who submit a survey at the end. Uh, out of a five-point scale, is 4.9 in June. By all accounts, solid, and for the year, about 4.5. So. You, you remember Mark Twain's uh, famous con, uh, comment, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics? I could claim victory. Uh, you know, we handle thousands of calls, and 99% of the people, 98% of the people are happy, and the relationship with our vendor is good. Um, that's what the statistics say. But remember at the top of the hour, I said, hey, put yourself in the people's shoes. And let's go back and, and look at some of these numbers a little deeper. And... Um, I'd like you to take that journey with me. Would you do something for me? A little audience engagement here. Um, <clears throat> I'd like you to do this. I need everybody's attention. I, you got to focus. You got to help me. Just, I want you to take your hand. Please take your hand and go like this. Okay, everybody, do it like this. And I want you to close your eyes and just sit there and keep your eyes closed until I say when. Ready? One, two, three. Go. Please open your eyes. <clears throat> that was 50 seconds. Seemed like an eternity, didn't it? I, some people opened their eyes, they couldn't do it, they wanted to check the cell phone. So that's the, putting yourself in the audience's shoes, that's the average time before you talk to a human being when you call the help desk. Um, now, that's the average time. That means half the calls take longer than, than what you just experienced. In my estimation then, ASA, average speed to answer, is a misnomer. I think it should be uh, AGT, average g glacial time to answer, as we just experienced. That, that, was, that was quite a wait. Um, so then, <clears throat> going back and looking at these numbers, you waited, and then you're on the phone for eight minutes. Now, eight times 60, correct me if I'm wrong, is 480. That's about 10 times the length of time you just did that. I'm not going to walk you through that exercise, mind you. But um, So then you're on the phone for eight minutes. And then looking over at, at the closure rate, to be fair, it's you know, three to four out of, out of 10 people aren't helped after, after you did that. You still have a problem. So next generation support is putting yourself in the people's shoes and finding solutions that are data-driven and that are pro 
proactive so that you don't have to experience that. Now at Pepperdine, we started Next Generation Support about a year ago, looking at data, the types of calls that came in, who made them, about what, when, and we, we tried to be proactive. And our first foray into this was <clears throat> looking at our top five requests, breaking down all those calls, all the numbers, the hundreds and the thousands. What are people calling about? And um, we analyzed requests, and this is an, an idle term, the Information Technology Infrastructure Library, Best Practices and Service Management. And we are by, no, where me, by any means of a full idle shop, but it's an aspiration. We're trying to get there. And so we, we broke out the requests. And this is for one month. Um, and all of these together represent about 75% of the calls that came in that month, easily categorized. Notice that password resets on the far left side comprises 29% of the total calls for that, that month. So we chose to employ next generation support and analyze this data and be proactive in finding solutions. Now, as, as Tom indicated, this isn't novel. I'm sure a lot of institutions, I hope all of your institutions have an automated password reset function, but at Pepperdine, we hadn't. It was long overdue. We tried something a number of years ago and, and didn't have the leadership to get it done. Um, but using this data, we did. <clears throat> and we automated password resets. You no longer had to call in. You go to a website like you do at your bank, and if you forget your password, they, you get it, one of your email or you get a, a text. And we did this in the September, on the, which would have been on the far left side of this. Now, I want to draw your attention to the legend. These are answered calls, the calls that come in and are actually answered. The legend indicates that the blue stuff is 2014 and the green is 2013. Common sense would suggest that can't be accurate because 2014 started in January, right? Uh, so what this means is this is our contract it begins the year. It begins in October 1st and ends in September 30th. It's roughly uh, ac an academic year, if you will. So what's called 2014 is actually starting in the fall of 2013. But anyway, just off this chart in September of 2013, we started this automated process. And as a result, come October, the calls dropped from 1,000 to 764. The next month from 1,000 roughly to 535. So deploying next generation support, we slashed our call volume, at the same time improving people's satisfaction and experience. They didn't have to sit through the phone as you did. They didn't have to stay there for eight minutes. Uh, they get, just got immediate text or an email and they could reset their own passwords. So emboldened with that success, we looked at other data. Average speed to answer, for example. Um, the chart indicates about 50 seconds is average. Um, that may not be unreasonable, seems decent. Um, but we took a deeper dive at the surveys that people, the so-called customer satisfaction surveys that people submitted. And one person indicated uh, that she waited 15 and a half minutes and finally got someone. Stayed on the line for about five minutes only to determine that uh, the problem couldn't be solved. So then she contacted directly the field support person who helped me with it in two minutes. He was awesome. Um, and so Clearly, there was some problem for that day, that person getting through. But then also, when she did, the person, it wasn't in, in the person's wheelhouse to fix the problem. And so, can things like this be obviated? Um, that's what next generation support is about, is asking, is there something that we can do about these cases? Please look at their closure rate. Now. Um, Recall that we, we automated passwords just off this chart, and so it's reasonable that um, the closure wait rate went down because password resets are virtually always closed by the help desk, and they no longer were. Um, but nonetheless, it still looks like four out of 10 people who call can't ever get their problem fixed by the help desk. It needs to be escalated, and isn't that true? So next generation support asks, why do those people even need to call if we know that they won't get satisfaction? They're just going to have that experience of that, that lady experience that I just mentioned. So think about this. If you have to wait average glacial time to answer and you stay on the phone for eight minutes, only be escalated to tier two 40% of the time, then how did we get 98% satisfaction rate in June? Um, I think there are a number of reasons why. 
One is that 60% are closed by the help desk. And the survey responses is that if the problem is in their wheelhouse, something like Outlook or Excel or Word, they get it. They can do that. They can do it very well, and, and, and they close those. Um, many people, another reason why I think we have a high rate, is uh, that many people who would otherwise be disgruntled no longer call the help desk, like that cartoon I showed you in the beginning. And so they're not going to report. But we know they uh, exist because of, Tom mentioned this TechQual survey, they self-report there, as well as in focus groups and, and anecdotally. Um, also, the reason that this number is, is high is that surveys are sent at the close of the call, and those high quality ratings often reflect the work done by tier two, as is evidenced by some of the qualitative feedback. I'd like to read just a couple to you. The first person I talked to was very nice, but unable to solve the issue. The second one did it immediately. Thank you. Second, as usual, the folks from Malibu who eventually came and fixed the problem were wonderful, exclamation point. The help desk person was not as helpful, indeed wasted my time, and actually made the problem worse. I've generally had this experience. Malibu folks, great. Help desk, not so much. Now, those that do mention our staff members by name say things, they're glowing. It's, it is a pleasure. We, were, we are thrilled. Outstanding service. And so then a number of the issues that come in can be fixed by the help desk, and those are fixed pretty well. And otherwise, if they're escalated, there's this disgruntled customer for a while who ultimately has a quality experience, and that's reflected in, in the quality ratings. So consequently, we are aiming high. And while we are nowhere near uh, uh, receiving the, the HDI award, the Team Excellence Award, clearly we do have an excellent team, as is evidenced in, in the feedback that we're getting, that pr provides great service when issues are properly diagnosed and routed to the, the, right, the right team. That helped us solve some problems very, very well to a high level of satisfaction. But we don't have the right mode to get the information to the, 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 the problem to the right person who can fix it. So we have uh, in, in, in Los Angeles a, a, a great opportunity and a, a privilege to have a relationship with the winner of this actual award for 2014. Um, which was the, uh, the Getty Museum. Some of you may be familiar with the Getty Museum, if not in Los Angeles, it's a tremendous facility. And they w won this award this year, employing um, basically next generation support, though they didn't call it that and they wouldn't, wouldn't perhaps uh, know that term. But a tour of their operation, my team went there, next, our next generation team went there, and that tour revealed the things that we discussed today, data-driven improvements, use of remote support tools to tunnel in and, and diagnose quickly and either fix or close a call, get them off the phone and, uh, and have subsequent, uh, the, the appropriate technician fix it. And then immediate escalation when needed. Indeed, at the Getty, they have their tier two and three people uh, man the phones at times. And so it's directly diagnosed and fixed, analyzed or, or subsequently uh, scheduled to be fixed. So our next steps then at Pepperdine are to preempt calls from ever coming in. And we're doing this in a number of ways. One is we are using a, a tool called device management. It puts a little agent on each, each university-owned computer, and it um, does a number of things. It, pro, it proactively patches. It, it analyzes what hardware and software is there. We can image, re-image for that matter. And in doing that, we're decreasing our number one incident here of virus software. When we first implemented it, only 13% of university-owned machines were patched for things like Java, Reader, Flash, the ones that are most vulnerable. And by flipping a switch, within one week, we had the high 80s, like 88% that were patched with the latest patches from all those things, thereby diving, driving down our calls. In addition, so that's one way we preempt calls because they don't need to. They're not going to uh, obtain those viruses. Another way that we um, preempt calls is by applying automated solutions. So when new applicants, prospective students, freshmen to the, the undergraduate school, apply, 
they're given a packet of information, including how to get into our portal and start doing a number of things. And they often will type in their campus-wide ID. It's a unique, unique identifying number, which is not what they're supposed to. It's supposed to be their network ID, but they don't know that. And so they call the help desk. And the tickets just spike. We have a very brilliant developer on our team who can easily program something that if you type in a number as opposed to your NTID, it'll pop up and go, hey, you're trying to do this, why don't you put in this other number, thereby driving down the calls. And so these are some of our initiatives to preempt calls from ever coming in. And another is we have self-service forms where someone can self-report a ticket rather than calling in and just get it in the system. Um, those forms are a little convoluted at this point. We want to revise them make them much easier. Again, just get them off the form, form just as quickly as you get them off the phone and, have, and then promote those much heavier. And so a number of these um, initiatives to preempt calls will drive down those, the, the number of, of, of tickets um, and um, will allow us then to mobilize trainers, will allow us then to siphon off calls that it should be tier two to go directly to those people and have the calls that are handled very well by the help desk uh, handled there because they'll be in their wheelhouse. So next year, I'd like to come back and report the success that we've had in some of these, these other initiatives. But in the interim, Tom will conclude our presentation by talking to you about some strategies you might employ and then some hurdles you may face. Thanks, Jerry. So effective strategies for designing uh, metrics um, and that's one of these things that definitely encourage you. I mean, I know the big data or, or data analytics is huge across the board, and we're literally trying to, to do that in, in everything on campus that has data. But to analyzing your existing calls and um, combating them in the future, I mean, really looking at that data, uh, if, whether it's footprints or whatever help desk and, uh, ticket, ticketing system you have, uh, pulling that data out there and really analyzing it deep, uh, having a group look at it, and then proactively looking at ways to solve that. Um, dashboard merits, uh, merits. I want, uh, I want dashboards. That's one of the things I put all over this new call center. Is like, I want dashboards. I want to be able to report to the chancellor, be able to report to the provost and the executive vice chancellor on all the information. Because that's so huge. That's, and this is just a side, but that's one of the things that we have a huge advantage in IT versus any other department on campus. We've got the data. We have the metrics for budgets, for all that stuff. All these other departments don't have this. So when we want to show that we need more resources, we've got the data to be able to go to the chancellor and say, look, this is, you know, this is how much we're being used. Uh, this is how vital we are to the campus. This is why we need this extra budget or these extra resources or this extra body. Um, so scorecards for the help desk or for the call center operators, um, not to punish the ones that aren't doing well, but to reward the, the ones that are, to be an incentive, uh, to be able to provide help for those ones that need to be helped a little bit. Um, and involving staff in designing the process. Um, that's big, sitting down with them. One of the things we're trying to do is have a bunch of different areas uh, involved with the call center to go ahead and have those, have some input in there and how we can design this, how we can make it better. I don't know everything. Um, how can we work with financial aid? How can we work with these other places that are, are customer service centric as we are and how do we figure out what they're doing? How can we improve this process? Uh, communicate, over communicate. I mean, that's, I mean, that's something that we need to can totally do. Um, maintenance uh, periods, you know, telling everyone when the maintenance period, we do a good job of it. We can always do better. Um, communicating out there, we're going to be down this weekend. One of the things I would love to do is for when someone calls our call center, uh, let's say they call on a Monday morning, that the people at the call center know that on Friday, the person's calling that there's a problem in, in Hunter, uh, one of our buildings, and there's wireless doesn't work on the fourth floor. But I would love to have the person that's at the call center know well, wow, you know what? On Friday, we did an upgrade to the, to the access point up there. That means that something must be wrong and wasn't fixed. We'll get someone out there to look at it. But I would love to have that where the call center people know exactly what's going on at you. They know what our maintenance is going on. And then conveying that out, because I've, I've seen this across the board. Whenever we convey, convey that, convey that uh, to our people and tell them, you know, be honest about it. You know what? I'm not sure what that is. I'll have someone look at it. Or heck, you know, what happened about a month ago, we had some uh, lightning uh, close to campus and wiped out one of our, the, uh, I think it was one of the switches in one of our dorms. So we had to put some extra attention on that to try and fix that. Well, that meant we were delayed in our network engineering for a couple days. So we had some problems that eventually came, I got an email and I had to deal with it. 
But it was one of these things, if we would have told them at the call center that, look, you know, it's going to take us an extra day to work on this because we're dealing with some other issues, they're understanding. Um, but, you know, it's one of these things that when we don't tell people what we're doing in IT, people assume we're playing with games or, you know, not doing anything. Um, so it's, that's why I'm all about over-communicate, internally and externally. Man, IT, we need to talk all the time and we need to communicate a lot. Uh, same thing out. You know, newsletters, I send emails out, but making sure Twitter, I mean, your website, whatever, making sure that you're communicating out there because we're all on the same team. Uh, as I, you know, we all get the same from, from I. We all get the same check from the University of Tennessee. Uh, I'm sorry, from the state of Tennessee. We're all you know, Tennessee employees. Uh, we're all on the same team here. There's no us, we. So make, make sure that we're emphasizing that to everybody. Um, expectations, very clear expectations of success for IT and for the campus. Uh, being clear to define what we need. Uh, SLAs, if you have, if you have those or, or don't have those, you know, start working on them. Those are good. There's expectations, so everyone's on the same team. You know what what they expect. The, what you know what they expect you, and there's you know back and forth there, and work on those expectations with them. Uh, what, for instance, we have um, one of our first ones we've um, have with our police department, so they know that we'll be out there in an X number of minutes, and we also know what software they're expecting us to do. At the same time. We're also saying, hey, that's fine. If you expect us to solve that software, you need to get the software to us, and we need to understand in order to be able to support it and fix it. Um, that time expectations, answer in 10 minutes, or we'll, if we can't answer it in five minutes or 10 minutes over the phone, you know what? We'll call you back, we'll schedule, and come out and do it for you. Um, but again, uh, classroom expectations. I put 30 minutes up here. I don't know why I put that. Because we all know that if your problem's not fixed in 15 minutes or 10 minutes in a classroom, that class is lost. And if you've got only, you know, if you've got a, week a weekly class or bi-weekly, if you miss one class session, your professor, your students miss a lot of opportunities. So um, that has to be ASAP. Uh, empowerment. Our goal is to empower the students, staff, and faculty to help themselves uh, and not to have to call the help desk. I know it's weird, but, you know, I mean, the whole thing, if, if, like, for instance, if it's a bank account or we're having a problem, we go to a website, if we can solve it on our own, great. That's what I try and do, as Jerry mentioned earlier. You Google, you Google it to see if you can solve it. And that's kind of the whole goal is to make them solve it on their own. Um, hurdles to success. Yes, there are hurdles, um, as we call them challenges at, U at UTC. Uh, why? Um, prepare for opposition. Yes, there, there will be some. Users, yes, they will want to call directly to the person they've got the help from in the past. That's going to happen. Again, as I said earlier, you need to go ahead and actually prove that you can do it. Um, and that's a, give them, ask for them an opportunity. You know, well, look, I know you're always going to call Bob, but this time I want you to go through the help desk and I'm going to make sure that works. And if you can do that and prove it, they'll go to, they're, they're only going to where they need to, where they can get help. If you can make that through the help desk, then you're golden. You've got it. Um, you just need to ask for that opportunity and that comes to having a relationship. Uh, training students. Yes, it's a challenge, but a uh, high turnover thing, but you know, really trying to dedicate, uh, develop documentation, buy pizza. Have, have them all come there for pizza and, and do a training session that way. Uh, and that will help you to get to, to getting consistency. Um, typical tier, and two through, tier two and tier three people want nothing to do with the help desk. What I'm trying to do is actually flip it off, that there's actually a trade-off. If you document, if you help the tier one, they're not going to call tier two or tier three because they don't have to. My whole thing is unless it's, unless it's truly broken, the system's broken, that they should be able to be helped by a tier one, but that means tier one has to have the knowledge, the documentation, and that documentation has to come from tier two or tier three, and also has the ability for accounts or whatever to be able to access uh, to help that person. So it's, my, it's a trade-off, but um, I think it's my welfare because the whole goal is for Tier 2 and Tier 3 to continue to do what they do, not have to worry about help desk calls. Um, foster relationships, working closely with colleagues to determine best way. You know, the customized needs. We all have customized needs in each of the different apartments or different schools you have. Knowing what those customized needs are. Going out, having your call center, having your field support people, develop relationships and sitting down there. One of the things that we've been doing at the UTC is actually sitting down with specific professors to learn the specific needs of their areas. Um, me, to my, the way I work is everything is relationship based. If you have a relationship out there, you can, that's credibility. Um, you can ask and you can use that capital. It, it, works, it works well. 
Again, the end goal is no calls um, so that people are able to be effective. When you walk into a classroom, when your professors walk into a classroom, they, put down the, they, they turn on the projector, they fire up the computer where they hook up their laptop, and they present in their class. That's the goal. Nothing was seamless. Just as you go in and turn on a light, the whole goal for us here is when you come to work, you turn on your computer, you use your computer. If you need help, you get it real quick. You're empowered to do it yourself. It's seamless. So let's go ahead and if, I don't know, do we have any time? So ladies and gentlemen, that's Next Generation Support. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and look for us next year. We're, I hope we'll give you uh, phase two of our successes. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.